I, I am delighted uh, to be here. I want to first of all thank uh, both Doug and Dr. Laverne. I knew Dr. Laverne before I knew her husband. And you're talking about two individuals that model Christianity. You see it in their lives each and every day. Uh, I know that Douglas has such a, a passion uh, for evangelism and reaching the lost. And I just thank God that I am privileged enough to call the two of them friends of mine. So thank you guys uh, so much for having me here. There was a guy one time named Ollie North uh, who testified before Congress. And he said, I'll tell you the good. He said, I'll tell you the bad. I'll tell you the ugly. And that's what my life is all about. The Bible says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I grew up in Louisiana in a drug-infested uh, neighborhood. Uh, when I grew up, uh, it was not uncommon to see the police in my neighborhood every Thursday, every Friday, every Saturday, over and over and over again. When I was a small child, I saw a lot of violence, and I asked the Lord, I said, if you ever give me a chance to get out of all of this, I'll go and serve you for the rest of my uh, life. I used to read the Bible, and I would mimic what I saw in the Bible. And there's a scripture passage that talks about how when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and how he went there and he prayed and the scripture says, you know, you know, as, as though blood droplets was coming because he was praying so intensely. When I was a little small child, I grew up with my mom and my brothers and my sisters, but my mom's uh, brother and uh, his wife never had kids. So they would take me over there and leave me with them. Mm -hmm. I remember at the time about five or six years of age, and I didn't like it, because I'm thinking, I'm here with these quote unquote old folks, and I want to be around my brothers and my sisters. But she'd always come back and get me later on. And then one Saturday, she left me there, and she said, you're gonna stay here. And I thought, this is not gonna work out well for me. So I vividly remember being put in uh, the bedroom and when my aunt and my uncle went to sleep, I recall how I got out of my bed and I went to the front door. And at the time they used to have uh, latches on doors that could lock, and I kept jumping, I kept jumping, and I could not get the latch open. So I told God, I said, if you are there, I'm gonna be okay tonight. And I'll stay here tonight, Lord but I gotta get back with my brothers and my sisters. The next 18 years I was there. <laughs> God never allowed me to leave. My uncle was my role model. He only had a second grade education. But my uncle taught me the importance of Christianity. My aunt was a English language arts teacher and she taught for 54 years in the segregated system they had at the time there in Louisiana. And I remember uh, I had to go to church on Sunday mornings for Sunday school, and then we'd have worship hour that morning, and then we had something called BTU, Baptist Training Union. I'd go back at five o'clock, and then we had six o'clock, another full service. But they only bought me one suit, and every time I got out of church, I had to, quote unquote, air out my suit. I had to take off my jacket, my trousers, my shirt, and everything. And my uncle ran the home like an Old Testament patriot. That once you got out of church on Sunday, you just had to wait there until it was time to go back to church. There was no watching, no television. It wasn't anything. You just had to be prepared. And I kept saying to myself, Lord, if you're this hard, man, I don't want anything to do with you. I mean, it seems as though it should not be anything wrong would watch a little television on Sunday after I got out of church, but he was that strict. And to this day, I'm thankful to God that he was the way that he was. I told you I grew up in an area where it was drugs, 
and alcohol. I can't tell you the countless number of people I saw get arrested. I saw a good friend um, had her throat slashed. I had a friend of mine who was shot in the eye and killed. And I saw all of this stuff as I was growing up. And I remember my pastor, I love my pastor, Pastor H.G. Woods. He would always talk about this evangelism stuff, evangelism. He'd always say, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He'd always say, for the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He always said, thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart, thou shalt be saved. They always say in the book of 1 John, these things have been written so that you can know that you know that you're saved. He would always say, for God demonstrated his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You should hear that. At the age of 11, something got a hold of me. I don't know, I didn't know what it was. I couldn't sleep at night, and I didn't know who to talk to. And so then I told God, I said, tell you what, I'll be an usher in the church. So I volunteered to become an usher in the church. God still didn't leave me alone. So I said, okay, well, what I'll do, I'll start singing in the choir. God still didn't leave me alone. And in Louisiana, the swamp areas, I said, okay, God, I'm gonna go out here. And if you are who you say that you really are, you're gonna have to deal with me. So I'm out here at this creek, out in the middle of the swamp area, and all of a sudden I said, Jesus, and honest God, truth, some fish started dropping in the water. And I ran because I was afraid. Because I was telling God, if you're real, you do these things. And he started doing them. And then I couldn't sleep at night. Remember I told you when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane? I went outside and there was a huge pile of stuff. And I got down on my knees and I started praying to God. And I said, I don't know what you're doing. I really don't even know who you are. But Lord, if you want me to do something, you gotta speak to me. That next Sunday, when I went to church, I'll never forget, I was 12 years of age, and Pastor Woods preached a message about all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. To this day, I cannot tell you how I moved from that third bench on the right-hand side down to the front, and I sat there in the chair, and my pastor was the type that said, you know, I want to make sure that you are saved. And I want to make sure that you understand what you're getting into. I was 12 years of age. I surrendered my life to Christ and I started preaching. And you know, in Louisiana, I was this little boy wonder because everybody was talking about this little boy, 12 years of age, preaching. Because I remember the passage in the scripture when Jesus and Mary and Joseph went to the temple and all of a sudden they couldn't find him. And he told them at that 12 years of age, he said, I must be about my father's business. And I preached the message that first time I preached, I preached that when Jesus touches your life, you got to tell somebody. And I thought, this is nice. I thought, this is wonderful. Then that's when things began to happen. I told you I grew up in a drug infested neighborhood. The love of my life uh, was uh, Marsha McGee little town in South Louisiana called Franklin Town. Marsha was beautiful. Uh, when I went to school, Marsha and her friend Renee were coming home from church. And I already told my cousin Chad, I said, now when you see Marsha, give her a kiss for me and tell her I'll be there to see her. A guy was driving a car bed, 110 miles an hour, crashed into the car that Marsha and Renee were in. Renee, they got Marsha out of the car it was care flighting her uh, to New Orleans, but Marsha died en route. They tried to get Renee out of the car, but the motor had pinned on her chest. The, motor, the car exploded and Renee was killed. And I was telling God, now, God, I'm doing all this stuff for you. And the person that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with, now I have no one. I remember Dr. Martin Luther King when he was talking about how he got tired of the civil rights movement, how he was sitting at a 
table there. He had this vision from God, and God told him, Martin, keep going. I can tell you to this day, I was lying in my bed at 6.17 p.m. on January the 27th. I saw this crystal clear lake, and I saw my body rise and was placed in this crystal clear lake. It started at 6.17, and I vividly remember at 6.23 coming out of this water, and I looked at the clock, and the Lord says, you're mine. You're now going to do what I want you to do. Remember I said I'll tell you the good, I'll tell you the bad, and I'll tell you the ugly? I was telling my fraternity friends about this experience that I had, and they all laughed at me. They all made fun of me. This holy rolling, this, this Jesus stuff you talk about, no real. And, and I was struggling. Because I thought, surely there's somebody out there who understands what I'm saying. I'm talking about Christ. I'm talking to my friends. Everybody started rejecting me. I told God, I said, Lord, what am I to do now? He took me to uh, the story of Elijah. Where Elijah on Mount Carmel was up there dealing with Baal. And all those folks we're doing all that stuff, and finally Elijah spoke and said, you know, get some buckets, dig a trench around it, and put water in it. And the Bible says that the fire came down from on high and consumed the offering. And I said, yes, I'm going to be the next Elijah. And then I read a few chapters later where that same man, all of a sudden now, hiding from somebody called Jezebel. And God spoke to my heart and said, you fear no one. If I be for you, then who in the world can be against you? I used to take Bible tracts, and I'd stand out in the middle of the streets, and I'd hand out Bible tracts. Some folks would take them, look at it, wad it up, throw it right back at me. Some would take it, drive down the street, I'd look at the car, it's flying out the window. And the Lord specifically said to me, remember this, son, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And it gave me great encouragement. And then all of a sudden, I got a call from a friend of mine uh, in Louisiana who was working at AM Commerce. And he said, <clears throat> Would you have an interest in coming and work at AM Commerce? And I said, Where is AM Commerce? <laughs> he says, It's in Northeast Texas. I said, Okay. So my dad drove with me here. Uh, we got in the car drove here, and we drove up on campus, and there was a uh, building called the Sam Raven uh, Student Center. And my dad said, Sam Raven. I thought, who in the world is Sam Raven? I don't know anything about Texas history. Talk to me about Earl K. Long and Huey Long and Edwin Edwards. Those are the folks that I knew from my history. And my dad said to me, he said, son, this is where the Lord wants you to be. And I thought, I saw a sign that said, Commerce, Texas, 8,913 people. I had more than 8,000 people in my neighborhood. Yes. And I'm gonna be in a town with 8,913 people where there's a McDonald's and where there's one Walmart and there's absolutely nothing to do in this town. But I said, okay, God, if that's what you want me to do, I'll be here. On a Saturday, I heard a guy bouncing a basketball. And I thought, yay, life does exist in Cumbers. Got named Jackie Reynolds from a town called, I say Cooper, I think right now they say Cooper, like C-U-P-R apostrophe or something. <laughs> Laverne County kind of goes. Anyway, so I met Jackie, and uh, Jackie, I take to the spirit to say, okay, we all Christian, we love one another. He said, I want you to come over to a town called Cooper, Cooper, whatever it is. So I said, okay. So I got in my car, and I drove down to the square. And I saw all these folks out there. And they had this big sign up there. And, and they were having a festival that they called Chigger Fest. Well, when I first saw it, <laughs> I thought it said something else. It sounded like Chigger. And I thought, 
Man, I gotta get out of this house. Yes, you are. <laughs> that cutie pose. <laughs> I just got you. So I left. <laughs> you get it, okay? That's okay. So, so I came back, and I'll never forget when I was here, and I didn't have us, didn't know anybody here, just lonely by myself in the late 90s and so forth. And I told the president, I resigned my position. I'm going back to Louisiana. Never forget, it was on a Wednesday. Saturday, I get a phone call saying, can you come to a town called Sulphur Springs? And I thought, okay, we got a Cummers, we got a Cooper, we got a Sulphur Springs. Knew nothing about any of these areas. I went over there, and a guy by the name of Dr. Marion Wheeler, who marched with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who also was there on that day in August when he gave the I Have a Dream speech, he said, I want you to work with me in the community, sharing the gospel of Jesus. And I thought, ah, this is a trick. You know, I've already resigned my position. I'm going back home. <clears throat> Sunday, I went to church with him. I go back to the office on Monday, and the president calls me in. He says, what is this? I said, I can't take it around here. He said, well, will you just wait till the end of the semester? And I said, okay, I picked in the semester. <laughs> Little did I know, I was invited to a church called East Cane Baptist Church. And I went there, and there was a guy by the name of Deacon Abe Dow, Deacon A.D. Bell, Deacon Bernard Askew. And they said, we don't have a pastor. Would you be interested in pastoring this church? And I thought, what in the world is going on now? I said, I'll come there. I'll preach for you that following Sunday. I preached a message entitled, Jesus, the Main Attraction. And it was a grand total of nine people at the church. Nine people. I thought, Lord, what are you doing? Next Sunday, it was 18 people at the church. Next Sunday after that, it's about 30 people at the church. The church started growing by leaps and bounds. And I had to repent to God because I know now my coming to work at a and Commerce had nothing to do with work at a and Commerce. It has everything to do with God knew that he was planting me at a church on County Road 2310 in a town called Sulphur Springs. And that's where I minister every Sunday morning by the grace of God, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. This place out here called a and Commerce is a breathing ground for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sharing with these young people that there is a better way to live. Sharing with these young people that there is something that is called life after death. When I teach my classes, my research deals with drugs and alcohol, and how it messes with the brain, and how it messes with your body. I went to college because I knew that I wanted to quote unquote fix people Little did I know I had to fix myself because I saw how it had impacted me as an individual. I saw how other folks would get mad and beat up people, and I couldn't understand how John on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday was perfectly fine, but John get a check on Friday, and all of a sudden John started beating up his wife, and then John would go to jail that Friday night, and then his wife Mary would have to go there and bond him out on a Saturday evening, and then on Sunday, he's just sitting there in a lazy bar, and the cycle repeated itself all over again. I had to get myself help. And I told the Lord, create in me, Lord, a clean heart, and renew a right spirit in me. Who am I to judge someone else? Because it's only by God's grace that I am who I am. I told you how I grew up. I saw people die. I saw people get hooked on drugs and alcohol. I saw all of that. But the Lord himself 
had me in his hands the whole time. So when I tell you I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I had uh, in, my, uh, in, in my office, uh, I have a cross that I have there on my uh, wall in my uh, office. And, and that cross to me means something. It's an emblem of suffering and shame. But I'll cling to that old rugged cross till I die and lay my crown at his feet. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my testimony because I am who I am by the grace of God. I encourage you, pray for us out there. Keep us lifted up because there are some of us out there we used to sing a song in my Sunday school church. It says, we are soldiers in the army, marching into battle every day. But at the same time, make sure that when you pray, call my name up. I'm Lavelle. If you can't remember Lavelle, just say Miss Gladys, boy. Because <laughs> I need somebody to stand in the gap for me. I need God to daily be that repairer of the breach for me. So that I can continue to be who God has called me to be. There's a famous poem that I often quote that says, two roads diverged into a yellow wood, and I, I being only one traveler, looked down one as far as I could to where it bent under the undergrowth. I should be telling this story some ages, some ages hence. Two roads diverged into a yellow wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Many of you remember that poem from grade seven, the road that's taken by Robert Frost. I'm thankful for the road that God has put me on. And I have nieces, and I read a book to them called Alice in Wonderland. And there's a wonderful quote in there that says, any road will get you there if you don't know where you're going. <laughs> the Bible says very plainly, a man's heart will devise his ways, but it's the Lord who must direct his steps. And each day, I tell the Lord, direct my steps according to what your word says. And every day when I walk on that campus, I whisper a prayer that says very plainly, Lord, you promised me that signs and wonders oh, would amen. go before me. Amen. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Amen. That's what I believe. That's what I stand on. I stand on the word of God. You guys have been wonderful to allow me just to share briefly about who I am. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, uh, we give you praise and uh, we give you glory. Uh, you're, you're an awesome uh, God. And because you're such an awesome God, Father, I believe uh, that on Calvary's cross, on what is described as Good Friday, uh, when the Savior of the world was there crying out, Eli, Eli, Laba Shabbat, to me, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? I thank you, Father, that when you turned your back on your son, you were facing a sinner like me and so many others, that you said in your word, that he was buried in the grave, but on that Sunday morning he was raised from the dead. And he declared then that all power is given unto me, both in heaven and in earth. And I believe, Father, that that same Holy Spirit, that same Holy Ghost power can convict hearts right now, can change lives. Father, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that if someone is listening to this voice of mine, that they will come into a right fellowship and a right relationship with you. I extend this invitation, Father, right now because you opened the door over 2,000 years ago. And because you opened the door, Father, when you open the door, no person is able to shut that door. Your word is so clear, Father, that you can reach down to the lowest valley and you can reach to the highest mountain. So, Father, if there's anyone who needs to know you and the pardon of their sins right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, draw them by your spirit. And then, Father, I pray also right now, if there are those that have gotten weary, those who've gotten tired, your word says, let us not get weary in doing the right thing, for we shall reap if we faint not. I pray, Father, that you would draw them by your spirit right now in the mighty name of Jesus, because everyone needs a place to call their church home. Father, I declare it, I decree it, and I believe it by faith that it's already done, for it's in the immaculate name of Jesus we do pray. Amen.